Chapter 21 The Edge of the World The crew spent the following day anxiously staring out toward the horizon, watching for any sign of the world's edge before it was too late to turn away and avoid sailing the Archon over a cliff into the abyss. But noon came and went, and even by Slip's most conservative reckoning, they were now beyond the furthest reaches of the map. The cold was so severe they barely noticed the signs of the cobalt sea fading all around them, and many of the crew continued to drink their bitter morning draught of the Trashlander's elixir each day regardless. The effects of the poison waters in their wake were not entirely behind them, though. The captain, usually to be found walking the railings of the aftcastle or perched in the ratlins, had taken to spending his days in his quarters and while he would make a great show of walking briskly among the crew upon each ring of the watch-bell, smiling and waving and doing his best to keep spirits up, his absence from the deck fostered a great deal of worry and rumour, and did nothing to quash the grumbling about the ill wisdom of their voyage. Slip, who, along with Kelpie, was the only one summoned to the captain's quarters, did his best to preserve morale. He offered a prize of triple rations to the winner of a stock tournament, ordered scrap timber to be burned in braziers on the deck for warmth, and even gathered the old band together to rouse the crew with a jig or two, though the music was always infused with a melancholy, and the player's fingers would quickly grow too numb to continue. Jim was only brought to the captain once, when Darge fetched him away from galley duty, quietly growling at him not to be alarmed at how the captain looked nor to repeat what he saw on pain of death. Even so warned, it took all of his control not to cry out when he entered the heated cabin. The captain, rarely seen without either a childlike grin or a scowl, looked almost asleep, except that his eyes and mouth were open, staring blankly at the stern windows and drooling onto the couch. There was bruising around his eyes that told Jim he had been vomiting, and the purple-stained lips spoke of heavy use of the iodine. Puggle, who had been absent from the mast ever since the whale attack, lay curled on the floor at the captain's feet. Kelpie glanced at Jim as he stirred a few drops of neat licks into a cup of hot water, and his pretty face was lined with worry and care. The captain did his best to force a smile and beckoned Jim over. To his shame, Jim hesitated before approaching, but Kelpie nodded that it was safe and gestured for him to go. It's not catching, he tells me, whispered Cap, propping himself onto his elbow. Just a little fever from the water. But Jim noticed some of the captain's bright red hair was left behind on the pillow. Kelpie brought the lick's tea and waited to make sure the cup was drained. This seemed to revive the captain a little, and Jim suspected it was this infusion that briefly gave him the power to walk among the crew. When we get there, Jim, Cap started, fixing him with a stare. It will be a close thing. We won't have long before Sar and the godsmen arrive. Your compass, will it take us where we need to go? Jim thought on the problem, not for the first time, then shook his head. It will take us to the island, I think that's all. After that, I'm not sure. I didn't tell Lotan about the code, or the vault, or whatever it is we are looking for. If he knew, I thought he might just kill us and go there himself, so... The captain laid a frail arm upon his, cutting him short. It's okay. You did the right thing. We have a few days yet. Something to think on, hmm? It'll be down to you, Jim, once we get there. Kelpie took Jim by the arm while the captain prepared to take his morning walk on deck. He'll be okay, won't he? Jim whispered. I saw some hair. Kelpie shushed him and checked that they were alone. If it was anyone else, they'd be dead by now. You know about his splice? Jim nodded. It still hadn't quite sunk in that the captain was so much older than he looked. I think it's helping him fight it off, Kelpie continued. He's very sick, Jim, but he's hanging on. He needs rest, though, and real food. 
The biting wind grew less fierce the further they travelled, but had settled determinately on blowing from the north as if to keep them away from Svalbard, and they were forced to burn fuel day and night to preserve any hope of making it there before Saar. And their fuel was running low. It was this, it transpired, that had drawn the captain below deck on the day of the whale encounter. He'd been in the hold with Scup, nervously measuring the diesel reserves that were now perilously low. So much might have been different if only they had stopped to siphon fuel from the drifting ghost ship. This fact, along with the constant growl of the engine, did nothing to ease the tensions among the crew. As the days passed, Jim felt the weight of the strange compass, on which they now relied, grow, and began to spend his evenings in Wayland's workshop, listening over and over again to Jen's testimony and using the now defunct map table to sketch outlines of Thule from memory, always doubting himself and revising some detail or other. When he grew frustrated, he would help Waylon tend to the captive magflies or distract himself with the techsmith's rambling lectures on code, science and the past. Nix often stopped by on her way to Gam, to whom she would bring bladders of water heated on the galley stove in an effort to help fend the biting cold. Gam himself they rarely saw. He kept himself bundled in furs at the masttop, always staring out northward for any glimpse of the lost island. But it didn't take Gam's keen eyes to spot what appeared on the horizon. Jim suspected even old blind John Kane could have seen it or at least felt it somehow. For seven nights after the whale's attack, the sky to the north was filled with ribbons of glowing green light from the heavens. The deck was eerily silent, the usual chatter of night sailing giving way to an overwhelming, almost oppressive awe. Even the precious braziers were covered with shrouds to better reveal the subtleties of the river of light that danced above them. Nix drew close to Jim, her pale face upturned like a canvas for the reflected green glow. Their eyes met for the briefest moment, torn from the wonders above so she could sign, We are close. And she was right, for while the night seemed to stretch on forever, with the coming of dawn, Gam called out excitedly from the mast top, Land! Land ho! At last, they had found Thule, though as they drew nearer, their worst nightmares came into shallow focus through the lens of the farlooker. Red hulls, red sails. The Rugian fleet had got here first. A dozen things shot through Jim's mind all at once. They were too late, there would be nothing left to salvage of the old scanned treasures. They were dearly outnumbered, so fighting wasn't an option. Perhaps they could simply turn round and flee before they were seen. They couldn't survive the Cobalt Sea again, but they could turn southeast and make for the yacht. They had rationed enough food for the return leg, but the fuel might fail them, and the captain mightn't survive the trip. Jim could see the same calculations going on in the faces of those around him. Darge had gone to fetch the captain, but had returned with Kelpie, whose face was pale and lined with care. The captain, can he... Started Slip, but Kelpie simply shook his head. We need to make land, Jim said, finding a firmness in his voice that seemed to take the others by surprise. You said there are twenty ships, said North, snatching the farlooker from Gam. We're not going to fight them, Jim, said Slip, laying a hand on his arm. I'm sorry, but the treasure's all gone. There's no reason to stay here. We should turn around. Jim, what are they... started Nix, but Jim swatted her sign away. It's not about the treasure, he pressed on. It's the captain. The others winced, and Jim lowered his voice. He needs rest and food and shelter, right, Kel? Kelpie gave a tired nod of agreement. He's very weak. Another voyage might... might not be wise. The unspoken truth behind the words caused them all to take stock. 
Jim's eyes flicked to Gam at the masttop who, overhearing, wore guilt upon an ashen face. He still blamed himself for the captain's fall from the rigging. Could we... maybe... sort of talk to them? Offered Waylon nervously. Tell them we aren't here for the treasure anymore. We just need a chance to... you know... We aren't bloody surrendering, spluttered North. Zar would take the ship. That would kill the captain for certain, growled Darge, gripping her sling staff with white-knuckled ferocity. Jim! Nix grabbed him by the shirt collar, forcing him to pay attention to her while the others bickered. They all have red sails. We have white. Jim frowned at her, frustrated. Yes, we are talking about whether to turn back or... But she cut him off with a gesture. When they took me, they were worried that I would stand out, white, among them all. They painted my skin with rust oil so that I was better hidden. She stared at him intently, willing her meaning to become clear. Jim looked up at the white patchwork sails luffing in the wind, then back to Nick's, his frustration replaced by a spreading grin. Guys, guys, I know how we can reach the land. An hour later, the timbers of the damaged deck and half the crew were stained hand and foot with the last of the iron din, and a half set of spare sails, now dyed a deep burgundy, were billowing in the breeze, pulling them once again on toward Thule. Jim, North and Slip had commandeered the map table, poring over Jim's half-remembered sketches. By comparing North's acute sense of magnetic north with the direction given by Lotan's compass and Gam's observation with the farlooker, they had an estimate of their bearing and the landscape ahead. They were approaching a wide, sheltered inlet on the west shore of the island. The scale of Jim's map was rough, to say the least, which made things hard, but worse than that were the unknown waters that waited for them. With no tech map, they could not tell whether the steep mountains that remained jutting from the icy water dropped hundreds of feet into the sea, or left a shallow field of barely drowned rocks to wreck unwary sailors. We should hug the coast, Jim said, getting used to the firmness in his voice. Our biggest danger is getting caught, and we're more likely to do that if we're out in the open. We'll have to go slow then. Eyes up top, watching for rocks, Slip cautioned. That's fine. It'll be just like the graveyard, and we can find somewhere to hide the ship better that way too. And so it was decided. They notched a mark on Lotan's compass and cautiously made for land. Gam was joined by the keenest eyes among the crew, who set themselves in the baskets atop the main and mizzen masts to aid in watching out for rocks, while Gam focused on the distant Rugian ships. Reluctantly, the winged hourglass flag was lowered, and orders were given for the crew to cover the scraps of purple fabric that marked each of them unmistakably as Arconauts. Jim accepted a clean but stained bandage from Kelpie and bound it over top the purple sash that covered his smicken eye. It was an uncanny feeling being so close to the fabled island after all this time. Even after Jen's account, there was still something that had felt impossible about the place, like it was only ever just another page from a story. But, just like Losselfheim, here it was in front of him. Real. Unlike Losselfheim, though, whose glittering halls hid the race of fair folk from the world, Thule felt dead, like some barely preserved relic from the past. The savage mountains with their crowns of white rock were majestic, certainly, but the sky was cold and grey, and there was no sign of life beyond the Tsar's ships. Great teeth of jagged blue-white rock rose threateningly from the water, and seemed almost to shift and glide about as if to undermine any attempt to navigate them. Perhaps long ago it had been the hidden utopia Jim had imagined, lush and green and bountiful, but today Thule's slopes were grey and dirty white and threatening. Forty feet, called Scup, who was manning a weighted line at the bow. Thirty-six. Ease the main, lads. Ease her off, 
commanded Slip as he strode between the masts. Jim darted to the starboard rails and peered into the clear water. The flat, grey light from above made the surface nearly opaque, but it was just possible to make out dark rocks sliding past beneath them. Most were jagged and irregular, but more than one looked unmistakably man-made. North adjusted their course to port, skirting the edge of the shallow waters that seemed to surround the island. Steady at thirty-two, called Scup from the bow, sounding relieved. The Archon's keel was only a little over twelve feet below the surface, but waters any less than thirty feet deep spelled trouble. All it took was a stray rock. Slip sprang up the aft castle stair and leaned in toward North. We're going to have to get in closer than this. We can't anchor and use the longboat this time. We have to hide her, North. I know that, growled the helmsman under his breath. But if I run her aground out here, we're fact, aren't we? Where from here? Slip asked, turning his attention to Jim. In there. Jim mumbled, fumbling with his hand-drawn maps and pointing toward a deep cleft in the rocky coast. It's narrow enough that we should be well hidden. Here, take this, barked North, shoving Jim toward the wheel and stomping away down the stair. Scup, with me. Away at the bow, Scup handed the sounding line to Daj and hurried astern. Wait, where are you going? Slip called after them. We can't rely on the wind. One gust at the wrong moment and we're done for. We're going to get the damn motor working. Keep her steady. Jim's hands grasped the spokes, sweating into the rough wood as he fought to keep the Archon skirting the edge of the shallows. He tried to conjure an imaginary line off their starboard side, demarking the treacherous water that, after all this way, still kept them just a few hundred yards from Thule. Even with only the half-set of freshly dyed sails and the mainsail eased, the gusting wind from the southwest still spurred them on faster than he'd have liked. He tried to picture the keel of the Archon reaching twelve feet down into the grey water, the sea floor twenty feet below that. The rocks he'd seen, they could have been just patches of dark kelp or even sand, but he couldn't help picturing jagged spires of rock reaching up to... Jim! Gam's cry carried from the masttop, the urgency in his voice causing a dozen busy heads to snap up toward the horizon. Jim looked up toward the masttop for Gam's hand sign, but there was none. He was simply pointing. Jim followed the line, his heart skipping a beat as he saw, rounding the headland before them, a red-daubed ship of the enemy. Panic rippled across the deck, and Jim felt anxious eyes turning to the helm. To him. He glanced up again to Gam, taking his hands from the wheel for the briefest moment to sign. What is their course? Gam turned to the incoming ship, then back to Jim. They are going to pass us, but only a hundred feet away. Maybe fifty. Fifty feet. Jim turned to slip. They'll recognise us that close, right? We should fight him. Caber said, more to the crew than to Jim. Come on, it's only one ship. Slip lowered the far looker, shaking his head. The Sea Eater. I don't recognise her, but some of her men might know us. A lot of Sars crew sailed on the Archon, way back. Jim's mind raced. If they turned about, they could try to outpace her. But there were at least two dozen other Rugian ships around Thule. It was only a matter of time before they were caught. They could try to fight, but the crew were tired, hungry, and morale was low. They'd need to disable her fast before help arrived. What's her draft, do you think? Again, Slip studied the incoming vessel. She's steel, quite heavy. I don't know, twenty, twenty-five feet? More than us? Yeah, more than ours, but... Right, hold on. Bracing his feet... Jim threw the wheel hard over to starboard. The Sea Eater would ground herself before the Archon. It wasn't much, but it was the only advantage they had. The Archon listed as the bow cut through the water toward the shallows. Slip stared open-mouthed for a heartbeat, then sprang into action. Shit. Okay, right. Fending poles. He called. 
Fenders to the bow! A handful of crewmen sprinted to the stashed poles, dragging them forward. Jim saw Nix among them, shouldering one of the great poles as the Archon began to bristle with feelers like the antennae of some huge insect. Twenty-eight! called Darge, the sounding line taut in her hands. Gam? said Jim, in a voice thick with forced calm. Forget the ship. I need your eyes up front. Any sign of something below, and you... The wheel bucked, and the deck listed to port. As the Archon slowly turned into her new course, the sails snapped taut into a close haul, dragging them ever onward into the shallows, heeling hard over. Twenty-four? yelled Darge, the steel in her voice faltering. What the hell is going- cried North, appearing from below, but his voice trailed off as he saw the looming bulk of the red hull. Oh, fuck! Hazard to port! cried Gam. Hazard to port! Again, Jim threw the wheel to starboard as crewmen armed with fenders leaned over the port gunnels to protect the hull, which groaned as it grazed something hard beneath the surface. As the turn carried them nose to wind, the sails faltered and began to luff uselessly, leaving the Archon to drift among the hidden dangers. Twenty feet! called Daj. We're going to need that motor north! Jim cried, but the helmsman had already scurried below once more. They're slowing! cried a voice from the top of the mizzenmast, and Jim turned to see the encroaching Rugian vessel was now sitting off their port quarter, her bow wave diminished, and the plume of dark smoke in her wake thinned. There was another groan from the hull as crewmen edged toward the damaged starboard gunnels to fender off the rocks. Only they weren't rocks. Even from the helm, Jim could see the unmistakable angles of submerged buildings. Fuck! There's a whole town down there, gasped Kaber, leaning over the aft castle's railing. There was another groan, but this time, instead of slowing the ship, Jim felt it shunt forward beneath his feet. At last, with a great belching of smoke from below, the motor sputtered into life. The crew cheered as Jim teased the throttle, bearing them away from the submerged buildings. North clambered from the hold, blackened from head to toe with soot and grease, and took the aft castle stairs two at a time. Eighteen feet! called Daj. We're going too fast, Jim! cried North, seizing the throttle and easing it off. Jim stepped aside, relinquishing the wheel to the frantic helmsman. There's buildings there, and more over there. He pointed vaguely at the grey water. Hazard starboard! cried Gam. Hazard! North spanned the wheel to port, but it was too late. With a great splintering crash, the Archon shuddered to a halt, throwing half the crew from their feet. The motor groaned and churned the water to stern, belching more smoke from the hold before choking and failing once more. Breach! cried Darge, leaning over the bow, where bubbles were rising from the hull. There was a banging on the deck below, and Scup's coarse voice carried up through the grating. Water coming in! We're taking on water! Captain on deck! cried Waylon from somewhere below them, but if anyone else heard him, they didn't react. Back off it! roared Kaber, lunging for the throttle. The motor's dead, you idiot! snapped North, slapping his hand away. Amid the chaos, a familiar whistle from the quarterdeck cut through the argument. Captain on deck! yelled Waylon again, and Jim leaned over the helm to see him supporting the captain by the arm as he struggled from his quarters. Slip! wheezed the captain, squinting up into the light for his bosun. Slip leapt down the stair and stood to attention. We're hold, Cap. Submerged wreckage. We were trying to lose an enemy ship in the shallow water. Slip pointed at the Sea Eater, which had now halted off their port beam. Bloody squint's gone in, started Kaber, but the captain held up a hand for silence as he stared at the lingering ship. Jim saw angry red scabs on the captain's arm. Blame comes later. Take a sail. Someone needs to swim under, drag the sail over the hull. The pressure will hold it. Enough to slow the water. 
Darge pulled off her boots and snatched up a line. And don't let them see you do it. They are watching us. Scup's head appeared from below. We've taken a lot of water, Cap. The hold's already knee-deep. Get everyone bailing, but off the starboard. Do not let them see. They're sending up flags, said Slip, peering through the far looker. Not sign I know. Must be fetch hours. Cap cut him off, taking the spyglass and squinting at the enemy ship. It's their own sign, only for SAR ships. They're showing help, need, question. North returned with a small chest of signal flags, and the captain snatched up a half dozen of the small pennants, arranging them on deck. Hull paint, Slip. I need black hull paint. Slip returned quickly with a drum of a thick, tar-like substance, and the captain daubed a black cross over a yellow square. Here. He thrust the flags to North. Run them up in this order. What does it say? asked Slip as he watched the other ship for any sign of action. Stay away. Sar. Business. Explained the captain. At least that's what it used to mean. Jim. The captain turned to him for the first time, and the guilty lump in Jim's throat swelled until it threatened to choke him. I'm sorry, I was trying- Blankets for Dash. She'll be freezing. Now, Jim. Jim sprang into action, snatching an armful of covers from the hammocks below and running them to the bow, where Darge was slumped in a shivering wet heap, having somehow managed to swim fully twelve feet down under the keel of the ship, all while dragging an old sail. Jim forced himself to forget her stern, prickly demeanour and threw the blankets over her before wrapping his own arms around her trembling shoulders, leading her astern and below, away from the wind. Scup rushed forward with a flask of North's hooch and led her towards the galley stove, which was miraculously still burning, despite the water slicking the deck. Did it work? She managed through chattering teeth. Aye, it's still coming in, but slower, said Scup, rubbing her arms vigorously. We'd already be under if it weren't for you, Daja. Jim hurried above once more alongside the sweating crewmen that were bailing buckets of icy water from the hold. The captain, Slip and the others were still watching the Rougian vessel anxiously while North carefully measured the water level below the gunnels. We've lost another foot, Cap, groaned North, marking the weighted line. Two more and it'll be coming in the portholes. They're leaving, hissed Slip, hushing the others. And sure enough... It seemed the captain's message had done the trick. Sea Eater was bearing away to the south. Right, let's get out of here before we sink, shall we? Sighed the captain as he sagged against the gunwale. Between the fickle wind, waterlogged hull, and the barely submerged ruins that seemed to press in all around them, the final quarter mile to Thule was perhaps the hardest of the whole voyage. Somehow, Scup managed to cajole a last dying wheeze of effort from the motor, and North's expert piloting, combined with the captain's command, gradually saw them safely to the inlet. Jim was banished to the bow to man one of the great fending poles, where he was met with a sympathetic smile from Nix, who'd managed once again to understand the mood on deck better than those who could actually hear what was said. Eventually they passed a narrow cleft in the dirty white rock, and the Archon was brought about, and guided into a deep, cold cave within that seemed to glow with an eerie blue light. The motor gave one last surge of power, heaving the battered hull to rest upon the safety of a steep, shingle beach within, where they dropped anchor and fastened the careen ship with ropes to drain upon the shore. Jim tucked the bewitched compass safely beneath his furs for the last time. They were hungry, half-drowned, frozen and sick. But at last, they had set foot upon Thule. Our voyage through the world of the Risen Tide continues in the next chapter, which will be here on YouTube in just a few days. New chapters will be uploaded on Monday and Thursday every week. Hit subscribe to stay up to date. Or, if you just can't wait, the full tale is available today on Audible, Spotify and more.
Thanks for listening.